Gabriela, thank you very much for being on Classic TV today. My um, in the preparation for this interview, I read something about your personal toy story, a toy that you got when oh, you were yeah. only seven or eight months old. Is it true? It's absolutely true, yes. And there are many uh, witnesses to it, many people who were there. Uh, when they heard me play for the first time, I was very, very small and uh, very young. My parents put a two-octave toy piano in my crib for my first uh, Christmas. It was supposed to be for an older cousin, but my grandmother insisted that I have it, so they obeyed. So I started to play all the melodies that my mother would sing to me at night. Uh, every day I would spend hours doing that, and uh, they realized that at 18 months, I was already playing all of those songs, so they found it uh, particularly strange, especially in a family <laughs> that's not musical, so I was the only one. Oh really? That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, and yeah. is it true that it's also said that you were playing the piano or listening and play, replaying melodies before you could speak? Yes, absolutely. That's, it uh, is my first language. Well, it's probably also for a good reason because you are so very different in a positive way, so very different Thank from you. all other classical or most other Thank well, you. practically all other classical <laughs> pianists I know. And uh, there's also some, somebody, a mentor, like uh, Marta Agerich, mm -hmm. who um, actually encouraged you to, to mm. keep doing what you're so great at, that, that music flows through you, through the ear. And how did you meet uh, Martha? Well, I mean, really the, the story begins because I, I improvised since I was a little girl. For me, the most natural thing would be to sit down and improvise. And I thought this is something that everybody did. It's just when something is normal for you, you assume that it's you know, normal for everyone. So uh, it wasn't until I was eight and I went to this teacher in, in the United States uh, that I stopped because she told me that it was worthless, that uh, I should stop doing it. So I did, of course, I was a child. Um, didn't improvise for many years in public. It somehow became my own private thing. And even in my 20s when I studied in London uh, with a wonderful teacher there, uh, the Royal Academy of Music, Hamish Milne, uh, they didn't know that I improvised. And it wasn't until I was 31 when I went to see Martha. I gave a concert with Dutois in Montreal. I went backstage to say hello. We had met a few times when I was younger. And I wanted to have a coffee and discuss being a mother, being a woman, being an artist. You know, how do you cope? How do you handle it? I mean, it's an almost impossible lifestyle. <laughs> and um, in a very Marta way, she just kind of looked at me and said, I don't know, you know, I can't give you any answers, but I, I would like for you to play for me. You know, so it, she didn't give me what I wanted. Instead, she was saying, play for me. I hadn't played in months. And that's what I did. I ended up playing for her the next night at 1.30 in the morning uh, and improvising as well. And she just said to me, you know, Gabrielita, what you have is so unique, it's so special, you have to share it with the world. Why, why don't you do that? And it was so clear, it was so obvious, it was like the Nike ad, you know, just do it. <laughs> you know? I said, yeah, okay, if you put it like that, yeah. So I buried all those years of doubts and, and, and thinking that improvisation should be something of mine because it was not done in the classical music world anymore. And I said, I don't care if people criticize me, if people don't understand, it's who I am and I'm going to be who I am. That's the great thing about getting older, you know? Yeah. So I did and, and it's been an incredible uh, trip in the last, you know, 12, 13 years that I have really improvised so, so much on stage as well as playing the classical repertoire. So, yeah which you're also extremely good at. We're Thank gonna you. talk about that later, but for everybody who plays and listens music, it's, it's almost a miracle how you do this improvisation because they're not just uh, playing around, they're no. usually very structured. Yeah. Does that already come to you in the first moment when you play the melody? Nothing, nothing. They're very structured, they're really spontaneous compositions. You know, uh, There's a misconception that improvisation is kind of noodling around or variations or little arpeggios and trills. It's not what improvisation is. In, improvisation or spontaneous composition is very, very, very complex and there's a lot of harmonic intermingling and that both hands should be equal and there's this dialogue happening between the two hands. Um, there's nothing that I plan, there's nothing that I know, there's nothing that I've thought of. It just happens exactly in the moment. But don't you have certain patterns that you no. can rely on? Really nothing, not? Nothing. Honestly, you swear I to God? Swear, I swear on my two kids. There's absolutely okay, that's, nothing. That's really sick. Just nothing. I mean, there's, it's impossible 
to think that there could be, uh, first of all, I wouldn't say it's improvised if it wasn't, because then that's not true, you know? So when I say it's improvised, it's just like a white canvas that I draw on in the moment, you know? But do you hear it? And, no. And does it, it doesn't go through the ear, I but the ear is definitely it. important. I react to it, but what's interesting is that in, a, in an effort to figure out how does this happen and how do I do this, uh, I can't say too much about it because it's going to be part of a documentary, but I can tell you that uh, they put me in, a, in an MRI machine for two hours in uh, the John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. It's, it's a specialist center, also in neurology. So I was um, with one of the leading uh, neurologists in the world who's also a musician himself, and he's done 10 years of studies on uh, improvising jazz pianists, which is slightly different. So I was my own case study. I was, I was my own experiment. So they made me do three different stages of the experiment, which I can't describe, but I can tell you that the results found that when I play a composed piece by someone else, like Bach, let's say I play the same piece, you know, many times, my brain functions in an entirely different way than when I improvise. In fact, when I improvise, the part of my brain that I use to play Bach and Beethoven and Rachmaninoff shuts down. So I'm using a part of the brain that is not normally used, that is never used to make music, to improvise. So even that I can't control. See, it's, well, there's absolutely nothing, nothing that is, uh, uh, how, how can I say, that is um, planned or anything. It takes over. Huh. Fantastic. So you did research on yourself, practically. Well, not me. They did. I was they just did. a okay. guinea pig. But it's, it's really interesting, interesting though. Really Let's interesting. Let's talk about your records briefly. You, you came uh -huh. out with, you already released a couple of very successful records, like, mm -hmm. for instance, Bach and Beyond. Mm -hmm. Now you have a new one out with the Rachmaninoff uh, Second Piano Concerto, excellently yeah. played with an all-American orchestra. Very precise, very much to the point, but also very uh, romantic. You. But then, yeah. as the second piece, uh, your first composition, which sounds uh, a little absurd because improvisation yeah. is basically yeah, also yeah. Uh, composing, but yeah. it's Opus One and mm -hmm. it's called Expatria. Mm -hmm. Please uh, give us a hint what it's, what it's about. Well, Expatria I wrote in 2011 because I thought, okay, I have to make a statement as a musician, not just in my interviews and in the press and my concerts, everywhere I go about Venezuela, but I have to actually write a piece of music that will affect people when they hear it to the point that they will understand what Venezuela has gone through the last 16 years now, almost 17. I wanted to write a piece where the listener um, could really visualize what Venezuela is about, the chaos, the destruction, the corruption, the violence, you know, the, the oppression, the violation of human rights, everything that we are, and really kind of feel in, in their bones, which is better than me just sharing numbers or me just, you know, saying, uh, you know, certain things uh, to the audience, giving information. I wanted the public to take a piece of music with them and not forget it, and then want to know about Venezuela. So Expatria is dedicated to the 11,336 victims of homicide in 2011. Last year, in 2014, there were 25,000 murders. So it gives you an idea of the scope of our tragedy, and it's a great vehicle for people in the classical music world or outside of it to really empathize with Venezuela. Mm. And it's my statement as a human rights fighter, as an honorary consul of Amnesty International that I am now, and, and as a Venezuelan who just wants to bring to the world the message that Venezuela is in the worst condition it's ever been. You don't hear it in the news, you don't see it, people maybe give the wrong impression, there's a lot of silence, but the truth is, is that we're a country basically at war and people don't really know about it. That's, that's very interesting. I mean, it's actually a piece of, you're using your music as a, as a piece of ag agitprop, actually, political propaganda, it's, if you it's, want. Uh, it's artistic dissent, yes. It's exactly <laughs> that, yeah. 
I mean, it also starts with an outcry and this pedal point on the strings mm -hmm. that cry and 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 ends with a furioso on uh, with with, with exactly. octaves on a, and on a exactly. And and the, and the orchestra and the piano are both protagonists. You know, it's not the typical. Uh, it's not a concerto. It's a tone mm -hmm. poem. Uh, in, in difference to Rahman, if you have a um, you know this kind of um, shared protagonism, or the orchestra is as important as the piano, but but there are moments where it's it's kind of um, standing back to allow the piano. In, in Expatria, it's very much a struggle. That's what I wanted. I, I wanted it to be a constant, constant fighting where both the piano and the orchestra were somehow um, subjected to a never-ending pain and never-ending humiliation. No? So it's, it's, you can hear the, the weapons, you can hear the gunfire in the, in, mm. the, um, in the piano part, you can hear how one instrument steals a theme from another, how the piano is constantly kind of trying to survive. So it's, it's a very, very physical piece, and it's a piece that really describes Venezuela. Extremely interesting. Well, Gabriela, thanks, Thank Emil, you. for being with us, and uh, hope to meet you again very soon. Likewise. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you. Sure.